Well, here's a moral question peculiar to these days. Is it wrong to mock people who publicly crusade against the COVID vaccine and then die of the disease? Or does it drive home the message about saving lives? There are entire websites that are devoted to such mockery. SorryAntiVaxxer.com gleefully tallies stories and photos of anti-vaccine advocates who end up in the ICU, intubated, and or dead from the disease. One recent case of this kind of tasteless taunting spurred two dueling opinion pieces in the Los Angeles Times. Orange County Republican Kelly Earnby, a former assistant DA and state assembly candidate who had lobbied publicly against the COVID vaccines, passed away earlier this month at age 46 from COVID complications. She was unvaccinated. Earnby's death unleashed a torrent of reaction on the internet. On her own Facebook page, under a Christmas collage that she had posted, there are now more than 4,600 comments. Some are sympathy notes. Many others are not. In response to the piling on, LA Times columnist Nicholas Goldberg wrote, I don't understand how crowing over the death of others furthers useful debate or increases vaccination rates. But a few days later, Goldberg's colleague Michael Hiltzig published a column expressing the exact opposite. Quote, mocking anti-vaxxers COVID deaths is ghoulish, yes, but may be necessary. Michael Hiltzig joins me now. He's the LA Times business columnist. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winner. Michael, let's make clear at the outset, you are not talking about the everyday people who don't get vaxxed, sadly contract COVID and die. You're talking about people with a platform, right? That's, that's correct, Michael. Uh, in my column, I made a distinction. I, I pointed out that the unvaccinated really fall into three categories. There are those who can't get vaccinated for legitimate reasons, small children, people with, with genuine uh, medical contraindications of vaccination. Then there's a fairly large group of people who I think have been duped into resisting the vaccine, duped by misinformation and disinformation about the vaccines and, and the sort of nonsense about preserving our freedoms in the face of this pandemic. The real targets who are important here are those who spent the, the, the last few months or years of their lives crusading against sensible, safe policies such as vaccination and social distancing and what have you, and ended up paying the ultimate price for their own, basically their own folly. I'm going to put on the screen the paragraph that I highlighted from your column. It's this, mockery is not necessarily the wrong reaction to those who publicly mocked anti-COVID measures and encouraged others to follow suit before they perished of the disease, the dangers of which they belittled. Expand on that. Sure. Yeah, you know, we have a sort of a cultural habit of not speaking ill of the dead, of treating uh, the deceased, as, uh, looking at the good they've done uh, during their lives. I'm not sure that in this case that's entirely appropriate because so many of them actually have promoted reckless, dangerous policies. And as I wrote there, they, they took innocent people along with them. So is mockery the only response? Well I, well, I don't know. But as I wrote, every one of these deaths is a teachable moment. And unfortunately, we haven't been learning from the lesson that, that we, sh we should be hearing from them. Many, I'm sure, will be watching this or have read your piece and say, but wait a minute, what about civility? In your column, you say civility's a fraud. What do you mean? Yeah, you know, the, the argument that uh, we can disagree, but we should always be civil, I think is usually in the hands of, of hypocrites. This argument is designed to distract people from what is really being said, and even if it's being said in the most forceful possible way. So yeah, when we heard about, when we hear about, uh, you know, these people have died, they've left, uh, they've left fa family and friends behind them. We should be civil about them. I think the problem there is that in this context, what we're doing is erasing the harm they've done to their communities, to their families, and to themselves. And I don't think that harm is something that we should be erasing. I think we should be underscoring it, mockery. Well, maybe that's one way. Maybe it's not the, the, the only way, but I don't think it's necessarily the wrong way. We need to find some way to remind people 
of what was going on, what what the, the, the deceased were, were saying and doing before they paid this price. You're in Orange County. Kelly Earnby was an Orange County politician. She's, she's not been gone a month. To those who say her life included a lot of good public works, that's what should most be remembered, you would say what? Well, I would disagree. I would say that, that her crusades against vaccine mandates, and she was crusading against these mandates even before COVID. I mean, she crusaded against a vaccine mandate in California that was designed to protect school children from being infected with measles and polio and whooping cough. Uh, so, uh, you know, as, as I said, these are policies that really were inimical to the public health and to, to uh, uh, community welfare. So, yeah, uh, look, in Orange County, we have a crisis in our hospitals and our ICUs, as we've reported at the LA Times. It's taking longer for ambulances to get to people who need to, who need to be transported to the hospital. Uh, we have uh, nine hospitals that have had to bring in extra wards and, and emergency wards to deal with the onslaught of, of COVID. Uh, this is a consequence of the sorts of policies that Kelly Earnby championed during her life. And do we want to forget about that? Michael, do we want to ignore it? I don't think so. Qu a, a, a quick final comment. When I hear of someone who dies of a motorcycle accident and wasn't wearing a helmet, I'm nevertheless sad for their loss. You know, poor, poor son of a gun is gone. Maybe I also say I wish they were wearing a helmet. Maybe I would have, it would have saved their lives. A fair analogy or not a fair analogy? And I'm limited on time. No, I think that this is very different. COVID is, is an infectious disease. Motorcycle accidents are not. They really affect just the, the, the motorcycle rider or driver, uh, COVID affects everybody and we need communal, uh, communal policies to combat it. I know you're getting a huge reaction, mostly favorable or unfavorable? Well, I'm getting mostly unfavorable reaction in my emails, but I think uh, it, it's clear from other metrics that people are reading the column. Uh, I think a lot of them are agreeing with it. On your own website, you ran a poll, and if I read it correctly, two-thirds of your respondents are in agreement with, with what That's I wrote. True. No, like 10,000 people responded on my website yesterday or the day before, and two-thirds agreed with your sentiments. That's true. Michael Hiltzik, thank you so much for your willingness to uh, get up early and talk about this. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here with you. Let's see what you're all saying via my own social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, et al. Not popular, but they are, they've been doubly victimized. Lack of critical thinking skills and disinformation. Not popular, but they are, they've been doubly victimized. Lack of critical thinking skills and disinformation. Look, I get his argument at the end when I raise the, the, the helmet, uh, the motorcycle helmet. Uh, that is an instance of, of, yeah, don't tread on me, individual liberty. I'm going to make this decision on, on my own behalf. And what Michael Hiltzig is saying is, is about those who have a platform and have used their platform to advocate against vaccine mandates, against vaccines generally. Uh, now they've gone beyond the motorcycle scenario and they're having an impact not just on themselves, but on everybody else as well.